Back in 1865, there was a, a tall, young Episcopal priest, a rector named Phillips Brooks. His church was called Holy Trinity Episcopal in Philadelphia. And he had the chance to go spend the Holy Land in Israel, something I've always wanted to do. On Christmas Eve, he rode a horse from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. It's about a seven-mile journey and sat for a Christmas Eve service that lasted from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. Now listen, we've got three Christmas Eve services at First Baptist Church. Combined, they won't last half that long, so I don't want to hear any complaints from you people, okay? But when he got home, he felt led to write a, a song. He wasn't a musician, he, he, but he could, he could write lyrics. And he wrote the words to this song. As Christmas Eve the next year rolled around, he decided he wanted that song to be sung by the kids, the children's choir, for the Christmas Eve service. And so he, sent, he gave the song, the, the words to the church organist and said, create a tune for this. And the organist struggled for a while, but then he had a dream at night. And in the dream, there was this tune running through his head and it went perfectly with the words. And so he put them together. And that's how he came up with the great Christmas carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem, that we sing to this day. Now, when we think of Bethlehem, we think of the words of that song and they are beautiful. We think of little kids in Christmas pageants with the boys with towels on their heads pretending to be shepherds, some, little, some lucky little girl getting to hold the baby doll and be the Virgin Mary. We think of nativity scenes in public places or out in front of our houses or in our living rooms. Think about the, the worship service that's televised live from the Church of the Nativity every year on Christmas Eve. Maybe you watch that. We think of Christmas cards and all kinds of beautiful pastoral images, rolling green hills. Maybe you picture it with snow, uh, but the stories about Bethlehem and the scripture are very different. So in this series, we're going to look at all the stories in the scripture about Bethlehem and what they have to say and what they have to teach us about who, who we are, what life is like on earth, and who God is. I want to talk about the first three times Bethlehem's mentioned in the Bible today. The first time is in Genesis chapter 35. Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, the father of the patriarchs of Israel, has decided to move his family from Bethel to Hebron. Now remember, this is the ancient world. There's no U-Hauls. There's no moving companies. It's a big undertaking. And meanwhile, his wife, Rachel, is pregnant. And one of the things you notice if you really pay attention in the Bible is there are no perfect families in the Bible. There are no perfect families, period. Even Jesus' Jesus's own family had its share of trouble. So Jacob's family is probably the most dysfunctional family you'll ever read about. But even in the midst of that dysfunction, Jacob loved his wife, Rachel. She was the one who he fell in love with the moment he saw her and he worked for her seven years to gain her hand and it felt like a few days because he loved her so much. And now here she's pregnant for the second time and they're on this move and this is what happens next in Genesis 35, 16. Then they journeyed from Bethel when they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel went into labor and she had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, do not fear for you have another son. Now this next verse is one of the saddest things you'll ever read. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she named him Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. Ben-Oni, by the way, in Hebrew means son of my sorrow. That's what, that's what she named her son as she was dying. And Jacob fortunately knew that her, this boy couldn't go through life with such a name, so she call, he called him son of my right hand, or Benjamin. Verse 19 says, So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb. It is the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. And you might have noticed in that verse, Bethlehem has two names. The word Bethlehem, Beth in Hebrew is house, Lehem in Hebrew is bread, so house of bread. But then the word Ephrath, which we assume was the name of the town before the Israelites moved to the promised land. So it's probably the, the Canaanite name. In Hebrew, it means fruitful. And I have to think that as Rachel was experiencing these hard contractions and feeling her body already beginning to fail, she must have wondered, why did my husband choose to move us now when I was so close to my time of birth? And I'm sure Jacob himself asked himself that question many, many times the rest of his life. Why did I put my wife in that jeopardy and now I can't bring her back? So the first story about Bethlehem in the Bible is a story of sorrow and tragedy. The second one is even worse. 
In fact, it's so sad, it's so disturbing, I'm not even going to read it to you. It's found in Judges 19. It's about a girl from Bethlehem who becomes the concubine of a Levite man. That means that she was a mistress, but not a wife. She had none of the privileges and protections of a wife, and yet she was his property. In the ancient world, this thing happened from time to time. In fact, quite often. Eventually, she knew, she came to know this was not a good man, and she ran away from him. Went back home to Bethlehem. But he came not long after, sweet-talking her and her dad into letting her come back. Ladies, have you ever known any young women who made the mistake of going back to a man who didn't really love them, who wasn't really good to them, didn't even have the decency to marry them. We've all known women like that. Maybe you've been that woman. And so she goes. And what happens is tragic. Again, I'm not going to share the details, but in the story, he sacrifices her to save his own life and horrible, unspeakable things happen to her. And you read, when you read the book of, you read the the Bible for the first time, if you're trying to read straight through, which I'm sure some of you will do that in the coming year, you get to Judges 19 and you read the story and you get done and you close your Bible and you say, why on earth did God put that in his word? And I'll tell you why. That, That story's there for the same reason the book of Judges is there. I know Judges has a lot of interesting and heroic and inspiring stories, characters like Deborah and Gideon and Samson, but really at its heart, the book of Judges is about, here's what happens when a, when a generation turns its back on God. Here is the chaos that results when a person, when a family, when a generation, when a community, when a nation turns its back on God. And the result is darkness, and the result is lostness, and the result is disaster and misery and chaos. And that's what Judges 19 is about. It's the low point in the story of Israel. The third story we're going to tell, and we're going to look at for the rest of our time together, it starts out quite tragic too. So it's the story of a woman named Naomi who was born in Bethlehem in the time of the judges. So that means very likely in a, in a village of about 500 people, which is what, ben, what uh, Bethlehem had then. She knew this young woman we talked about from Judges 19. If she didn't know her personally, she'd heard of her. It may have not been the same generation, but in a town that small, believe me, you would know that story. Naomi was married to an Israelite man and had two sons. Eventually there was a famine in the land and so... They heard that there was food in Moab just across the Jordan River. And so they did what Jews were never supposed to do. They left their homeland and migrated to pagan territory. And they made a home there where there was food. The two boys, in fact, married Moabite women, which was not supposed to be done. And then tragedy struck as first Naomi's husband died and then both of her sons in rapid succession. Now listen, Some of us have experienced the death of a loved one. Some of you maybe have even gone through the death of a child. There's nothing worse. But for Naomi, it was was even more than that because she had lost everything. In In that culture, if you were a childless widow, especially someone like Naomi, who was of the age, she knew no one would want to marry her. So she was without hope. Her life, at best, would be in the condition of a beggar, uh, of someone who families might bring her food when they had something left over. At worst, she would starve to death. She heard that there was food in Bethlehem back where she was from, and she decided to go home. Her two Moabite daughters-in-law came to her saying, we'll go with you. She said, don't go with me. There's nothing for you there. One of them said yes and stayed home. But the other one, a woman named Ruth said, I will never leave you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Where you die, I will be buried. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Naomi said, okay, suit yourself. When she got back to Bethlehem, the women there recognized her and they said, Naomi's home. She said, don't call me that. Naomi means pleasant and I'm not pleasant. I, call me Mara because I'm bitter. And that's what that word means in Hebrew. I am bitter of soul, bitter of heart and spirit because as she says in verse 21 of chapter one of Ruth, I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. You ever felt like that? Like God must have fallen asleep or he's against me because I used to have things and now I don't have them. I used to have people I loved and now they're gone. I used to have a life that was worth living and now it's all gone and I got to think God's responsible. 
And this is the world Naomi lived in. It's a world where chaos reigns, where, where women die in childbirth or get brutally abused and murdered or they experience tragedies that leave them with nothing except a pagan daughter-in-law who's too stubborn to go home. And all people in this village, this town of Bethlehem, all people who were struggling, all people who were weak, all people who didn't have power or agency, they were under the heel of evil. And it was a tough, tough world to live in, a dark, dark world to live in. And you know what? We live, we live in Bethlehem too. We live in a world like that. In fact, this first, the first service this morning, I, as I, I didn't expect this, but as I was reading some of these passages to the congregation, I, I started getting emotional because nothing's wrong with me or with my family. We're doing fine. But this week, just several different families in the church got hit by heavy stuff, by death, by tragedy, by terrible diagnoses, by life at its worst. And it's hard. And I don't know the half of it, even though I'm pastor of this church. In fact, would you do me a favor? If right now you're really, really struggling, if right now you feel like life is dark, right now you feel like there's no hope, would you just raise your hand so we can see who's struggling? Yeah. So, thank you. The good news is the book of Ruth, like the rest of the Bible, it's a story of redemption. It's a story of of God doing something amazing without doing something miraculous. Because there's no miracles in the book of Ruth. There's no times when, the, the, you know, when, when God multiplies food or walks on water. There's no time when Ruth or Naomi hear his audible voice. But, but let me tell you the theme of the book of Ruth. In fact, the theme of the scriptures themselves. You ready for this? God is always working to bring peace to our chaos. God is always working to bring peace to our chaos. That's what he does. That's his full-time occupation. God doesn't have a hobby. He doesn't have a job. He doesn't need to sleep at night. All he does 24-7, 365 is redeem. He redeems the fallen. He redeems the broken. He redeems the enslaved. He brings light into darkness. He brings peace into chaos. That's what he does. See, at the beginning of the story, Naomi's a widow with no sons who's too old to get remarried. And this whole story, they never hear God's voice. And yet, by the end, they experience his redemption. Let's walk through the story together. So four verses I want to show you, uh, and I'll show you how it all links together in the beginning of the story. Chapter 1, verse 6. Then she, meaning Naomi, arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she hears, there's food back home. I better go home. Then verse 22 says, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. It's one of those details that when you read the book of Ruth, you're always eager to skip to the end. You want, you want the hallmark ending, right? So you're going to skip over little details, but... This is an important detail. There's no coincidence that they happen to come at the beginning of the barley harvest, and that becomes very important later. In fact, I'll tell you why. Because there was a law in Israel. It was sort of God's version of welfare. It was a social safety net that said, if you own land in Israel, every year when you harvested your crop, you were required to allow landless people to come and glean after your harvesters. What that means is, as the harvesters were going through the field and they were picking heads of wheat, they would drop some, they would miss some. If you were poor and landless, you could go into that property and you could take what they missed. And that's how you could survive. That's how you could provide for yourself and your family if you were willing to work. Ruth says to Naomi, I've heard about this law in Israel. You and I don't have anything, so I'm going to go gleaning today. Ruth says, uh, Naomi says, suit yourself. Chapter two, verse three says, and she happened, Ruth did, she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz. And then in verse 20 of chapter two, this man, this is Naomi speaking, this man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. So Ruth comes home and she says, I've been gleaning in the field of a man named Boaz. And Naomi goes, Boaz, Boaz, oh, He's related to us. When it says he's one of our closest relatives, the word there in Hebrew is literally the word that means redeemer. He is our redeemer. Because get this, get this. 
Naomi is in Moab. She's grieving. She doesn't want to go on living. She just happens to hear there's a report of food in Israel, in Bethlehem. She goes home. Ruth decides to go with her. She rejects the gods of her youth, embraces the God of Scripture, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one true God. They happened to move back home. Just so happens it's the beginning of barley harvest. And Ruth just so happens to walk up to a field belonging to a man named Boaz. And that man just so happens to be related to Naomi, which means if he's a good and a godly man, he'll know that there's a law in Israel that says, if there's a childless widow in your family, it's your responsibility as a man to redeem her. That means you marry her, you give her sons that will care for her in her old age. They won't be your sons, they'll be her sons. You have to be man enough to do what, what, is, what is good for that family, what is good for that woman and the, the continuing line of that family line. There's hope, in other words. See, chapter 2, verse 20, is the first time in the whole story when Naomi starts to see just a glimmer of hope. She starts to see, she starts to see there's, there's a chance that I'm going to get out of this alive. There's a chance that my life will be worth something again. And by the way, now I see that this, this young woman who's been clinging to me like a leech, actually, she's my, my blessing, my salvation. She's not just some yoke around my neck. She's willing to break her back to provide for me. I haven't been able to see that before because I've been so caught up in my own grief and my own misery. But now I see God left her to me for a reason. She also begins to see, I think Boaz has a thing for Ruth. I think he's into her. And that's exciting. That's exciting news. See, Naomi's an older woman. She has the wisdom of years, and she knows how these things work. And she says to Ruth, listen, there are things you have to do to make this happen. It's risky, but this is our only hope. Later on, when they're gleaning the, the barley, I mean, when they're threshing out the barley, they're taking it into the threshing floor. It's a time of celebration. After the work is done, they're going to feast. They're going to drink wine. They're going to be happy. They're going to lay down in that threshing floor and just sleep on the floor. What you need to do, Ruth, is you need to put on a dress that shows Boaz. I'm no longer a widow in mourning. I am a woman who is eligible to be married. And you are to go down to that threshing floor and you're to uncover his feet as he sleeps and lay down beside him. And when he wakes up in the night and he sees you laying there, you're supposed to say, throw your blanket over me because you are my redeemer. Now, does that sound a little risque? It's not. Nothing nothing funky is about to go on. But it is risky. And here's why. Because it's very forward in a society where women weren't allowed to be forward. It is essentially saying, why don't you marry me, Boaz? You don't have a wife. I don't have a husband. We need each other. Marry me. And he didn't have any reason to say yes to that. He didn't have any outward reason. If you would have been Boaz's buddy, his wingman, right? You would have said, don't marry Ruth. Number one, she's a Moabite. Moabites aren't even allowed in the sanctuary of God, according to Jewish law. Number two, she's a widow. Any sons you have with her will be considered the sons of her dead husband by Israelite law. Number three, she's got a a, a widowed mother-in-law and you'd be responsible for her too. You're a landowner. You're an eligible guy. Women all over this region would love to be your wife. I don't care that you're not the best looking guy. You've got land, okay? You have options. You have prospects. And yet look what happens. I'll I'll skip over. You can read it yourself. The the charming story of when Ruth follows through with her plan and how that all goes. But I'll, I'll just skip to the end. Chapter four, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. So that's a beautiful statement for a couple of reasons. First of all, it tells us 
that Naomi begins to see, not only is Ruth worth more than she thought. Remember, when Ruth and Naomi get to Bethlehem, Naomi doesn't even re- uh, introduce her daughter-in-law to, to her friends. She's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's her. And now her friends say, you've lost your two sons, you've lost your husband. This girl is worth more to you than seven sons. Now she gets it. Now she sees what God was doing. He didn't take her sons and her, her husband. That's life. That's the result of living in a cursed world. God gave her something else, something that would make up for that loss, something that would redeem. Notice also, Boaz is willing to redeem them. As I said, he didn't have to do this. There was no outward, uh, on paper reason why he should have. And yet, when you read the story, you find out Boaz is not only willing to redeem this this young woman and her mother-in-law, but he's eager to. He's rejoicing in it. There's this great story about how he says to her, oh man, I'm so excited about this, but there's technically a guy who's more closely related to your mother-in-law, and so he has the claim, I need to deal with him first. And so there's this long story about how he goes and negotiates with this guy in front of the village elders, and he negotiates so skillfully that the man renounces his claim on Ruth and that land and that family, and Boaz is free to marry her. And it's beautiful. And here's the best part. Chapter 4, verse 16. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name. Y'all, I, I got to tell you, I've read this a million times. I've preached on it many times. I never noticed until this time. Boaz didn't name his own son. Ruth didn't name her son. The women of the neighborhood named the boy. Now think again about what we've read so far. What's happened in, in Bethlehem? We've seen a, a woman die giving birth. We've seen a woman abused, mistreated, and murdered. We've seen a woman lose everything. This is a world where women and others without agency suffer. And now these women see how God came through. Behind the scenes, working in ways they could not see, suddenly there's this redemption that comes out of nowhere and say, okay, we know what to name this boy. They named him, it says, they named him Obed. The name Obed means worshiper of God. We're going to worship the Lord who has redeemed this woman who we love. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Y'all know that name, right? So Naomi starts the story as a a childless widow, and she ends it as the great-great-grandmother of King David. Ruth starts out the story as a pagan without hope in the world. She ends it the great-grandmother of King David. And that's not it. That's not even the best part. Matthew 1. I got to warn you, if you decide this Christmas, okay, I've never done this before, but I'm actually going to read, I'm going to read the Christmas story from the Bible, and you think, okay, I'm going to start at the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew 1. Be warned, Matthew 1 starts with a genealogy, okay? Not the easiest part of the Bible to read, but don't skip it. In the genealogy, there are four women named. This is remarkable because in the ancient world, women were never listed in genealogies unless maybe, maybe, maybe you had like a, the, a, a forefather who was, or a foremother, I should say, who was like related to royalty and you would put her name in there. But these four women who are named in Jesus' genealogy, none of them are royal, none of them are remarkable except for the hand of God and one of them is Ruth. Ruth is right there in the line of the Messiah. See, we live in a world filled with chaos, a world that is covered in darkness, and Jesus didn't have to redeem us. See, Jesus is the better Boaz. He's the ultimate Boaz. He had prospects. He had options. You know what Jesus could have done after he created the world and we warped it and messed it up? He could have said, okay, let's just burn that up and let's create a world full of nothing but golden retrievers, okay? At least they'll be happy and obedient and, and, you know, it'll be a harmonious world. But he didn't. He said, I want to redeem that world, even though it's going to cost me everything. Jesus wasn't just willing to pay the price of redemption. He was eager. Hebrews tells us that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That Jesus, although he went into hell on earth on Good Friday, he went there with joy in his heart, knowing what it would accomplish, knowing it meant your redemption and mine. Now think about this for a minute. Think about all those seemingly random things he did to bring Ruth and Boaz together. 
Now think about if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus here today, if you think about it, you can think of relationships, you can think of conversations, you can think of events that happened to bring you to the point where you were willing to say, I am a lost sinner and I need a savior. Some of those things that happened in your life were bad. Some of those things were painful. God was working through all of them to bring you to that place of redemption. And he's not done yet. Every one of us ought to have a sign around our necks that say, be patient with me. I'm still under construction because God is continuing to work for your redemption. He's still working to bring peace into your chaos, to bring light into your darkness. Next week, we'll see how God brings another great story of redemption into the city of of Bethlehem in the form of a young man named David who we've already talked about and how the spiritual leader of Israel comes into that town to call David out of the shepherd field. But for now, I want you to think about this. In that same town of Bethlehem, the ultimate redeemer was born, the ultimate Boaz, and that was Jesus. And he is redeeming you to this day. And if you want to live a life of significance, if you want to find light in your darkness and hope in your, in, your, in your hopeless existence, if you want to find peace in your chaos, the best way to live is to say, Lord, I am going to live walking beside you so that I can experience your total redemption, so that I can be, become completely the person you created me to be, so that I can, I can live out everything you planned for me from the very beginning and so that others around me will see that redemption and want to be saved. That town of Bethlehem, the site of no many, so many tragedies, today we think of it as a, a place of redemption because that's what it is and that's what he can do in your life. He can bring peace to your chaos if you will let him because the hopes and the fears of all your years are met in him and him alone.